We're looking at Psalm 37. If you have a Bible, please have it open. It's a Psalm of David. It comes towards the end of his long and eventful light. You see verse 25. He says, I have been young and now I am old. And the theme is clearly stated in the opening verse. Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. It's an issue that we often grapple with. And so the title I've taken this morning is this, When the Wicked Seem to Get Away With It. It troubles us, it disturbs us. Whether we're looking at the world stage or whether it's closer to home. Look out on the world, Putin invades Ukraine, Ukraine suffers, Russia suffers, the rest of the world suffers, but Putin seems to get away with it. And it troubles us. Or you look at a a score of countries around the world, Myanmar, Belarus, Niger, and so many more, corrupt rulers. They bleed the country dry, nothing seems to happen. Even if they are chased from power, quite often they seem to hide away their ill-gotten games. They seem to get away with it. Or come a bit closer to home. Maybe there's a godless person in your workplace, a bully or someone who's unkind or a boss that's on the fiddle and they seem to get away with it and it troubles us. Maybe there's somebody in your family or in your community and they're always stirring, they're always causing trouble and they seem to get away with it. And maybe I'm speaking to someone here this morning and it's personal. There's someone that's personally caused you great grief. It was such a situation when a family member uh, caused great grief to myself and my wife some years ago and was when this psalm first impacted me. Notice what David doesn't do. He doesn't say why. Why doesn't God do something? There are actually plenty of other psalms that do that, so you can look elsewhere for that. Instead, what David does, he tells us how we should respond, how we should deal with it. A few introductory comments. It's poetry. This is a psalm after all. It's 40 verses in our English, but it's only divided into 22 in Hebrew, which is also the number of letters in the Hebrew alphabet. You see, it's what we call an acrostic. There is one verse for each letter of the alphabet in succession. It's something that's used in 9 or 10 of the psalms, famously in Psalm 119. So if you take an English example, we can show you how it works. So you could have A, for acknowledge the Lord. B, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. C, commit yourself to him. D, don't go back to your old sins and so on. You can complete that at home. You might struggle when you come to X or to Z, although I guess the Burroughs household might be flexible and cover the Z. But you see how it works. It's a poetic device, something they used in Hebrew poetry. And it was an aid to memory because they took the memorization of Scripture seriously. But because the sequence is dictated by the alphabet, don't always expect it to be a logical progression. This is not the Apostle Paul, you know, where he takes one layer of logic and then builds another layer of logic on top of that and on top of that. No, this is David, the poet. And so the ideas and the themes keep repeating. It's like looking at a fabric, maybe a tartan or something like that, and you see the same red, blue, and green threads, and they keep reappearing, and they're woven together, but overall, they make a pattern. But to help us, I've tried to gather the thoughts that are here under headings to help us uh, keep it in our minds. They're not watertight headings. There's plenty of overlap between them, uh, and there's plenty of repetition through the psalm, so I won't comment on every verse. If I did, did, we'd be here a long time. Your dinner would be cold uh, today. But you can reread the psalm, and I trust you will, and meditate upon it at home. So let's dive into it. I've divided into three. And the first 11 verses we'll consider under this heading. Don't fret, trust the Lord. Don't fret, trust the Lord. Now, of course, that is easier said than done. I'm sure you would agree with me on that. And so he gives us plenty of reasons, plenty of encouragements. Indeed, that's what the Bible does. Whenever the Bible tells us to do something, or indeed not to do something, it also gives us encouragements or reasons why. Here there are a string of imperatives. I counted 13 or 14. You can scan them with me. Verse 1, do not fret, nor be envious. Verse 3, Trust in the Lord, do good. Verse 4, delight yourself in the Lord. Verse 5, commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him. 
Verse 7, three imperatives here. Rest in the Lord, wait patiently, do not fret. And verse 8, cease from anger, forsake wrath, do not fret. So one after the other come these instructions, these imperatives, these commands. But they basically boil down to two main thrusts, two main lessons, one negative and one positive. They belong together, the negative and the positive. They complement each other. The negative one is don't fret. We have that three times, verse 1, verse 7, verse 8. Do not fret, do not fret, do not fret. And the positive, trust in the Lord. We have that twice, verse 3 and verse 5. Trust in the Lord. Let's consider the negative one first, then. Verse 1, do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. The word fret here means to burn, to get heated, to get hot under the collar, all steamed up. Do you ever do that? Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to put your hands up and confess. Do you ever feel like throwing something? Go on. Have you ever felt like throwing a cup of coffee against the wall? Well, sometimes I see something on the television that makes me so angry I want to throw the remote at the, uh, at the television. I just remember how much a new telly would cost and I don't do it, but you know, it's getting hot. Well, here's the first reason, the first encouragement that he gives when it's not fret is verse 2. For they, the wicked, will soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. It's a theme that's going to recur throughout the psalm. Contrast their future with yours. You know how it is, uh, you get a lot of rain, the green, but the virtues of the roads grow up, all lush and green. Then the council come along and they mow it all down and in a few days, if the sun comes out, it's all gone yellow and it's like straw. And he says, they'll be cut down like grass. It's so easy to envy the wicked, isn't it, when they seem to get away with it. But soon they're gone, he says. Their success will be short-lived. So there's the negative, do not fret. Here's the positive, verse 3, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Again, it's easy to say, but what does it actually look like to trust in the Lord? This is much more than just kind of a tick box of things that you agree with. No, he's going to tell us what it means to trust the Lord, but it includes doing good. Trust in the Lord and do good. I just mentioned the second half of verse 3, which is difficult to translate. There's at least three possible translations here. Uh, We have feed on his faithfulness. If you have the ESV, it has befriend faithfulness. The NIV goes in a different direction and says enjoy safe pasture. It seems to me that the sense here is to revel in his faithfulness. Commit yourself to him, trust in him, and revel in his faithfulness. You see, verse 4, commit your way to the Lord. Sorry, verse 4, delight yourself in the Lord. Delighting in him, praising him, listening to him. It's the fact that the more we focus our thoughts and our energy on him, the less we focus our thoughts and our energy on the evildoer, the wicked, the one that seems to be getting away with it. You want an example? Think of Paul and Silas in prison. Were they fretting over a miscarriage, a gross miscarriage of justice? Were they fretting and getting hot under the collar about their brutal and illegal treatment? If they had, we could forgive them for that. But listen, they're singing praises. They're delighting in him. And if you know Acts 16, you know the amazing outcome of that story. Delight in him. Verse 5, commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him. The word commit here means to roll your way onto him. So take all your angst, all your burdens, all your situations and roll them onto him. And remember, the Bible doesn't tell us to do this without giving us encouragement and giving us uh, the reasons why we should and we ought. I want you to notice a couple of little words here that are repeated three times, he shall or he will. Verse 4, he shall give you the desires of your heart. Verse 5, he shall bring it to pass. Verse 6, he shall bring forth your righteousness. He shall, he will. It's definite. This is the truth that's summed up up in those words of Proverbs 3 that 
so many of us cherish. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. So when the wicked seem to get away with it, this is your rock. This is one of your anchors. He will, he shall. There is no doubt about it. In verse 7, he continues, rest in the Lord, wait patiently for him. Be still before him. Wait for his time. We'll say a little more about that in a moment. But then in verse 7, he returns to this theme of don't fret. Don't fret because of him who prospers in his way. Verse 8, don't fret, it only causes harm. You see, there really is no point in fretting. No point in getting angry with man. No point in getting angry with God. It doesn't achieve anything. It only achieves more evil. James, in his letter, puts it like this. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not work the righteousness of God. So what should we do? Leave it to him. Leave it to him. Verse 9 through to 11 reinforces really what we've already been told in verse 2. God can deal with it and will deal with it in his own way and at his own time. So when the wicked seem to get away with it, don't fret, but trust the Lord. I just need to mention something about terminology in passing. We've had the word evildoers and workers of iniquity, and here we have the word wicked, and he uses this word wicked, I think, 14 times through the whole psalm. And when we hear the word wicked, we tend to think of people who are especially evil, done especially obnoxious things. But in the Bible, the word wicked is used somewhat differently. It's all those who refuse to put their trust in him. The wicked is all those who refuse to repent of their sin, all those who therefore remain enemies of God. In God's eyes, humanity is divided into two camps. It's not black and white. It's not male and female. It's not rich and poor. But the wicked those who will not repent and have not believed, and the righteous, or his saints. And of course the righteous doesn't mean the self-righteous, those who think they're right, but those who've been declared righteous. They've come to him for forgiveness and they've been declared right. But by nature we're born wicked. We're in that camp and something has to happen. We have to move from that camp of the wicked to the camp of the righteous. And the only way we do that is by repenting of sin. Have you repented of your sin? Have you asked for forgiveness? Have you put your trust in the Lord Jesus, the only way? So there's the first part of the psalm, first 11 verses. Don't fret, trust the Lord. The middle section, I've called this, and I borrowed this from my favorite commentator on the psalms, Derek Kidner, God's often hidden help. First 11 verses covered the first six letters of the Hebrew alphabet. This section covers the next eight letters of the alphabet. And interestingly, there are no imperatives here, no instructions at all. But the theme is this. The Lord is at work, and he's working out his purposes, but often in ways in which are hidden. We're unaware of them. You go to theatre and you see a play or a, a musical... And if you think about it, you know that behind the scenes are technicians and and stagehands and they're dealing with the the props and the scenery and the lighting and the sound and all the rest of it. But if you met them in the street, you wouldn't recognize them. You see, hidden helps. And we can pick out a number of ways this theme is shown. Here's the first. Persecuted, yet never forsaken. Verse 12, the wicked plots against the just and gnashes at him with his teeth. The Lord laughs at him, for he sees that his day is coming. See what he's saying? God will have the last laugh. He's got it all under control. This is the message of Psalm 2. It talks about the nations. Why do they rage? And then he says, the kings of the earth set themselves. The rulers take counsel against the Lord and against his anointed, his Christ, and say, let us break their bombs in pieces. Let us cast away their cords. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord will hold them in derision. He will have the last laugh. And then it goes on in that psalm to say, I put my king on my holy hill, King Jesus, King Messiah the Christ. Verse 14. 
The wicked have drawn the sword and bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy, to slay those who are of upright conduct. Their sword shall enter their own heart and their bows shall be broken. You see how often the persecutor's plotting backfires. Now the Lord delights to reverse fortunes, to turn things on their head. History shows it time and again. Think of the Acts of the Apostles. Stephen is martyred. He's stoned to death. And what happens? Is that the end? No, it's the beginning. Believers are scattered. The gospel spreads faster than a Mediterranean wildfire. And one of the persecutors, Saul, became the church's greatest ever missionary. And all those other persecutors, they were swept away to oblivion when the Romans came calling in AD 17. Bring it closer to our own time, the days of communism in Eastern Europe, behind the Iron Curtain, the persecution of Christians, and yet the church grew faster, stronger, and healthier in those years than any other time. How often the persecutors plotting backfires. You see, persecuted but never forsaken is one of God's hidden helps. I don't know how it's going to pan out in Ukraine, and I don't suppose anybody else does. One thing we do know, it's not just tough for the average person, it's especially tough for Christian believers in the occupied areas, in Russia itself, in Belarus. But of this I am certain, when the tale is told, it will be a story of God's often hidden help, persecuted but not forsaken. Christian brother, Christian sister, we will face opposition. Jesus said, if they hated me, they will hate you also. But he also said, blessed are you, for great is your reward in heaven. Hebrews 13 verse 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So where you may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? persecuted but never forsaken. In the next few verses, having nothing, yet having plenty. Having nothing, yet having plenty. Verse 16. A little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked. We may be penniless in earthly goods, but in Christ we have riches that the unbeliever can only dream of. Listen to how Paul describes it, Ephesians 1 verse 7. In him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound towards us, lavished upon us. Or Romans 10, there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call upon him. Have you called upon him? Have you been saved? Then you have riches. Verse 17, God will break the power of the wicked. Verse 18, he's got his eye on his people. Verse 19, they shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. You see, we have Jesus. We have the one who knows how to make a little go a long way. Just think, five loaves and two fish. And with inflation still sky high, and mortgages about to cost a lot more, That's something we can take to heart. We may have nothing, yet we have plenty. Verse 20, what about the wicked? The wicked shall perish. And the enemies of the Lord, like the splendor of the meadows, shall vanish like smoke, they shall vanish away. Those who seem to get away with it, have you been on the Great Central Railway or you've seen the steam trains there? And the, the engine is in full steam and a great impressive cloud of steam and smoke. And three minutes later, where is it? It's gone. It's gone. He says, they're just like that. They're just like smoke. They vanish. Sometimes when somebody dies, people get a bit nosy and inquisitive and they suspect that the person might have been quite wealthy and keeping it a bit quiet. Have you ever heard the question, how much did he leave? Well, you always know the answer. How much did he leave? All of it. All of it. And there's an irony here, verse 21, the wicked borrows and does not repay, but the righteous shows mercy and gives. You see, the wicked is out for all he can get, and yet he's never got enough. And the righteous is generous, even with the little he has got, but he always has enough. 
he or she will always prosper in the end. And then finally in verses 25 and 26, David reinforces with his own personal observation. I've been young and now I'm old, I've seen, but I've not seen the righteous forsaken nor his descendants begging bread. It's not a general universal rule for all times and all places, but sometimes God's people do experience poverty. But God has promised. And Paul writes to the Philippians promising, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. And incidentally, he's addressing generous Christians there. He's commending them for their giving and then just says, my God will supply all your needs. I think there's one more hidden help we can mention here, though, and it's this. Stumbling, yet always upheld. Verse 23 and 4. Steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. A while back, I was taking a hike in our nearby uh, range of hills where we live. On this peak of Crook Peak, I decided to take what I thought was the quickest route down. It was a bad mistake. The footpath is longer. It would have taken me 10 minutes. My route, although shorter on the map, took me about three quarters of an hour and involved fighting my way across rubble and boulders and through brambles and undergrowth and it was definitely a bad move and I stumbled and fell a few times. You see, sometimes we stumble and fall because we're stupid. I was stupid. But he keeps us. He tells us here our steps are ordered by the Lord. He establishes our steps. He tells us in verse 23, the Lord delights in our way. Here it's speaking of him delighting in us. But he will not let us be utterly cast down. Verse 24, he upholds him with his hand. Think of Peter. When Peter stumbled, when he denied the Lord three times, why was Peter not destroyed? Answer, Luke twenty-two thirty-two. Jesus says, I have prayed for you that your faith shall not fail. Jesus, our King, your King, your High Priest is on the throne of heaven praying for you 24-7. Stumbling, yes, but always upheld. Watching over you, protecting you, planning for you, caring for you, though it's often hidden from sight. We don't see it till afterwards, but it's a fact. So no need to fret over the wicked. As far as you're concerned, you are safe and secure in him. We come now to the final portion of the psalm, which I call Take the Long View. The remaining eight verses in Hebrew, eight letters of the Hebrew alphabet. There's another change of gear. The imperatives, the commands come back. They come back in three pairs. Verse 27, the first pair. Depart from evil, do good. He's really repeating and reinforcing what he's told us earlier on in verse 3. Verse 34, two more imperatives. Wait on the Lord, keep his way. It's uh, repeating and reinforcing something he's told us earlier in, in verse 7. And then in verse 37, another pair of imperatives. Mark the blameless man and observe the upright. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. So here's one thing that comes back. The imperatives return. The other thing that returns is those little words, he shall or he will. There were three earlier on and there are three more here. Although one, one is slightly disguised. Verse 28, when it says he does not forsake his saints, should really be rendered, he shall not forget, forsake his saints. And then verse 33, the Lord will not leave him. You see, again, you've persecuted but not forsaken. But then notice this in verse 34, he shall exalt you. He will raise you up. Whatever happens, you have glory in store. And that brings us really to the thing that I think is highlighted and prominent here this point about contrasting destinies, contrasting futures. So take the long view. Don't just look at the here and now, but consider the long view. He's already flagged it up earlier on. In, we go way back to verse 9 for a moment. Those who wait on the Lord shall inherit the earth. 
In a little while the wicked shall be no more. You'll look for them, but they shall be no more. Verse 11, the meek shall inherit the earth. Where have I heard that before? Answer, Matthew 5, verse 5, Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Description of a Christian. Crops up again in verse 22, this inheriting the earth. Instantly the word earth or land is the same word. Again in verse 29 and verse 34, six times in all. In the Old Testament, the focus was rather on the land, some land to build a house, some land to sow your crops and to sustain your life. But a spiritually minded folk always saw beyond that. They saw something more than that. And if you don't believe me, check out Hebrews 11 at home. Look at Hebrews 11 verses 13 to 16 and you'll see how Abraham and co. saw more than just a bit of land in the Middle East. And when it comes to the New Testament, where our eyes are lifted to our inheritance, we will inherit the earth. What do you think of by an inheritance? Maybe you think, ah, I dream of a rich relative leaving me the money and I can pay off my mortgage. Or maybe you're just thinking of your grandmother's wedding ring. Or maybe you're just thinking of your dad's collection shed full of rusty old tools. Whatever your inheritance. Christian, you have an inheritance, and it's infinitely greater than any of those things I mentioned, the rusty tools or the mortgage being paid off. This is how Peter describes it. It's worth putting it on the screen to remind us what he says. You've been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus, to an inheritance that is incorruptible. That means it doesn't perish. Not like those hot water bottles that perished in the, in the equatorial heat undefiled and does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. He says, take the long view. You're an heir of God, a joint heir with Jesus. Nothing can change that. And what is so closely in verses 28 to 20, 27 to 29? And I want you to look out for a word that's used three times. The little word, forever. It's an amazing word. Depart from the Lord and do good and dwell forevermore. The Lord loves justice and does not forsake or shall not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell in it forever. Forever. Not just for a while, not just for a generation or two, but forever. So when the wicked seem to get away with it, what have you as a Christian got to look forward to forever, forever with the Lord? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine what that will be like forever with the Lord? Verses 30 to 34 repeat things that we've been taught earlier, so we'll skim over those. Verse 35 to the end is a story of contrasting destinies. Verse 35, I've seen the wicked in great power, spreading himself like a native green tree, yet he passed away, and behold, he was no more. <clears throat> Indeed, I sought him, and he could not be found. You see, David says, you see that mighty tree in the woods? Maybe it's an evergreen, one of our versions thinks it might be a laurel, whatever, though. You see that great tree there? It's impressive, isn't it? But this one, David, says it's got a cross daubed on it. It's for the chop. The next time you come past, it won't be there. There's not a trace. It's gone. He says that's how the wicked are. But contrast, verse 37, mark the blameless man, observe the upright, for the future of that man is peace. He's not a perfect man. He's a, if he was a perfect man, there's no hope for any of us, is there? He's the blameless man, the upright man or woman, the one who has confessed their sins and is walking in the light and is trusting in the Saviour. He says there's a future for that person. And how long is that future? Forever. Eternal. Without end. So take the long view. There's a contrast that Jesus spoke about quite a bit. Think about what he said about the two destinies, the two ways to live in the Sermon on the Mount. He says there in Matthew 7, 24, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I'll liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. 
But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. If you're still in your sins this morning, you will perish with the wicked unless you turn to the Lord, unless you repent, unless you put your trust in Christ. You'll be like that house on the sand. But if you come to him right now, even this morning, you can be like that, and you will be like that house on the rock. So, when the wicked do seem to get away with it, and they often do, what are we to do? Don't fret. Don't fret. That's difficult, I know, but don't fret. Trust rather in the Lord. And think of God's often hidden helps. How we're persecuted, but not forsaken. We have nothing, and yet we have plenty. We stumble and yet we're upheld. And take the long view because you have a glorious and eternal future. Friends, brothers and sisters, I commend this psalm to you for your prayerful meditation in the coming day.